Uh, okay, it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today that, who is uh, Pierre, uh, Pierre Minar. Uh, Pierre is a postdoc, postdoc uh, uh, researcher at the University of Magdeburg, uh, where he's working in collaboration with Carl Randa Carpentier. Before, he was a postdoc uh, at the IRIA in the SQL team, where uh, I get the, the chance and, uh, to, to, to meet him and, uh, and work with him, where he was working in collaboration with Emily Kaufman and Michael Balkol. Uh, before he obtained the PhD from the University of Toulouse, where he was supervised uh, by Aurelien Garivier and uh, Gil Stolz. Uh, uh, Pierre has done uh, an amazing work uh, on, uh, on banded reinforced learning. Uh, you may know uh, a few of, uh, of his works uh, covering, uh, you know, exploration, regatinization, uh, pure exploration in RL and in bandit. So a lot of amazing, amazing work. Uh, and today is going to, uh, to to talk about a model free learning for two player games. And uh, with this, the, the floor is yours here. Okay, uh, so thanks a lot for the introduction and uh, the invitation to this seminar. So um, <clears throat> I will present our paper, um, model free learning for two player zero sum game, um, like with imperfect information. So it's a very long title. And uh, it's a um, joint work with Tadashi, Kozuno, Remy Munoz, and uh, Michel Valco. <clears throat> okay, so um, uh, I will split the talk in two main parts. Uh, for, um, so uh, here the goal is to learn how to act optimally in an uh, imperfect in information game. And I will first make a, a long detour um, through uh, uh, MDP, or the one player case with, with three MDP. Uh, where I will present uh, uh, our algorithm, and then I will show how we can use it uh, in the second part uh, for um, in, an imperfect information game. Okay, uh, so as usual, we consider so uh, tabular Markov decision process, uh, so with a finite number of states and finite number of actions. So we also consider that this MDP is episodic with an horizon H, and we fix a uh, deterministic reward function here um, and um, transition probabilities, uh, which will depend on the step. Um, it's not very important here. <clears throat> um, and like the main assumption is that we will uh, consider three MDP. So we uh, impose a three structure. That is like all the um, you know, information about the story is contained in the state. Or precisely, if you... Um, if you fix a state, then there is a step H and a, a subject trajectory, uh, which is the only way uh, to go to this state. So uh, it's illustrated here on the left. Uh, so uh, like if you have one state, then you have only one way to go there. Uh, so um, at first sight, it's, it's uh, like a strong assumption uh, with what we know usually, but this will be enough for what we want to do later with a uh, game. Okay, and uh, so as usual, you, we can uh, write uh, the value of a certain policy here in red. So uh, this value is, um, is just like the weighted sum of the reward um, <coughs> weighted by uh, the probability to go to state action SA in blue here. So it's this um, rich probability uh, under the, um, the policy mu. And uh, what is important in our setting is that because of the three structure, you can split this uh, rich probability in two terms. Uh, so the first term in, in red here, it's, it's like a um, uh, term due to the agent, and uh, in green here, it's due to nature. Uh, precisely, uh, uh, we will call this term in uh, red the realization plan of the agent. And uh, what is this term? It's just a product of uh, the probability given by the policy to the action, to the sequence of actions that lead to the state that we consider in, a, in a, uh, to the action that we consider. So since we have this tree structure, uh, if we fix a state S and an action A, then we have only one trajectory lead to the, that lead to the state at step H. And we just here multiply the probability uh, of um, uh, choosing the action and counter along this trajectory under this policy uh, uh, mu. Uh, and like importantly, this quantity is independent of the choice of the reward and of the nature, because 
um, since we have fixed the trajectory uh, with the states and uh, the actions that we consider. And same thing, this term it's green where we, we will call it the realization plan of the nature. And this time it's not like the, the probability of action under the policy, but rather the probability of uh, obtaining a certain state under the transition probability. Uh, so same thing, uh, you fix your uh, state S, you go along the trajectory and you just multiply uh, by the transition probability, uh, the, um, uh, the, prob the transition probability of uh, having the next state given the action and the other uh, state. And again, this thing is completely independent of the policy of the agent because uh, of this uh, tree structure assumption. And uh, yes, so uh, wait, wait, wait. there, there's a, there's a there's a B in that transition probability as well. So can you explain that in the bottom? Uh, there is a uh, sorry, a what? So so in the bottom in the transition probabilities, it's conditioned on S, A, and B. What is ah, B? yes, sorry, no, it's a typo, there is no B. Uh, right, it will be B should be the action of the opponent. I see. Yes, That's yes, right. uh, oh, no, okay. it's, there is no B. I it's see, a so typo. here's the typo. Okay, right. Uh, so this thing should not be there. <coughs> uh, it okay. will appear later, yes. So, yes, so we have this rich probability Wait. that we can split into terms. Sorry. Small clarification question. I'm wondering about whether there is any tree structure here, or is it just like the fixed horizon setting and like you have these stages and then therefore yeah. for every if you don't if you don't have a tree structure you will need to do a summation right like you can have multiple paths that goes oh, to the same yeah state. okay because these are yeah okay these are just a multi the accumulated product of right, 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 right. action probably we, we don't fix the trajectory here but like every trajectory is identified with a state okay fine yeah okay uh, and so, um, so yeah, so we have this factorization here. Um, so, and um, and uh, again, so we can write the value as this um, uh, as this weighted sum. So, like we will uh, also like keep one part in green, which is like due to nature of the choice of the transition probability and the reward. And on the left, we have the realization plan of the policy. Um, yeah. And I want to insist on the fact that, uh, so given a realization plan, uh, just as we did, we can compute, uh, no, given a policy, sorry, yeah, uh, we can compute a realization plan by multiplying this probability along the trajectory. And uh, conversely, uh, given a realization plan, so the set of realization plan, it's, uh, we can describe it, in fact, um, um, precisely, uh, and but I didn't give the detail here, but it's a convex set and you, uh, you it's with a certain um, type of constraint. And uh, so if you pick one um, uh, possible realization plan, then you can convert it to a policy just by normalizing it. So here you just normalize the realization price so that uh, when you sum over the action, you get one. And, uh, for, and if this sum here, uh, the denominator is equal to zero, then you can pick whatever you want. Uh, but it's not really interesting because you, you have zero probability to go there. And uh, in this talk, I will, in fact, uh, identify a policy, even if there is no objection between the two, a policy with uh, a, a realization plan. Um, because like we, we will do that because like from the point of view of the value function, this will not change uh, uh, what you do where there is zero probability to go there. Um, okay, so uh, like yes, but so the important here is that uh, I will uh, constantly switch between uh, policy and realization plan. Um, and so uh, this is uh, the learning framework that we will first uh, consider. So we will uh, try to learn with uh, adversarial MDP. So the procedure is the following. So we have a fixed number of episodes, uh, T here, and we assume that simultaneously the nature will choose uh, the transition and the reward, and the agent will choose uh, a policy uh, here. And given these two choices, we will generate a trajectory uh, in our uh, MDP. So uh, as usual, you have like uh, the agent observe the current states, then you, you pick uh, an action uh, given the policy, uh, you sample it given the policy, then uh, you get the reward and you uh, generate the next state. 
And uh, what is important here is that like the only feedback to the agent is the trajectory. So the only observation, it's like the sequence of state and action and reward. And in particular, the agent does not know like the, the reward and transition probability picked by the nature. And um, uh, um, like to measure the performance of an agent, so we will uh, measure it through the um, uh, regret here. So the regret will be Should like be the max. Sorry. Yeah, this is more like the semi-embedded feedback, right? Yeah, yeah, it's not. It's, yeah, uh, I will tell it later. It's like trajectory feedback. Like it's not bandit feedback. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes. Um, and so, and uh, yes. So the regret will be like the difference between uh, like uh, what you could get uh, in expectation, following uh, following a fixed policy, and what you have really. So here, like the value depends on the choice. So I have this small t in green, which depends on the choice of nature. So it's not really the regret you have usually in um, in adversarial learning. It's rather what by what is called the pseudo regret because we have a range over like uh, the choice of uh, the randomness of nature uh, uh, used by nature and the policy. Um, and uh, so the main, uh, let's say, like. Uh, idea in the uh, of, of our approach is to convert uh, this learning uh, setting to uh, online linear regret minimization. So why we can do that is just because uh, if we go back to uh, um, like how we compute the value of a certain policy, then since we can factorize like that, so it's just uh, nothing more than a big uh, than a scalar product between two big vectors. So in blue, in red here, sorry. It's a realization plan of the policy, new. And in uh, green here, we can see this as gain. So it's just like the realization plan of the nature times the reward. So we have two big vectors, and we just take the scalar product. So it's in particular, it's linear in this uh, realization plan um, variable. And uh, yes, like for, uh, like for the analysis, we, we will rather consider um, loss. So we just take one minus the reward, but otherwise nothing changed. And, uh, and, and our regret is exactly what we have for online linear regret minimization. That is uh, this quantity here, uh, this scalar product. So it's inverted here because we consider loss instead of gain. And yes, uh, as you mentioned, uh, it's not really bounded thing back in the sense that we not only observe the let's say the sum of the reward after uh, one episode, but we observe all the trajectories. So we have more information. And um, one natural choice uh, like to deal with this uh, problem is to apply online mirror descent uh, type algorithm. So what, what we do, uh, in pro uh, like, uh, uh, we basically find the next uh, policy or realization plan by minimi minimizing like uh, the um, the value, so like here it's like uh, uh, maximizing the value since uh, like uh, we have loss, and not going too far from the previous um, um, policy or realization plan, thanks to this uh, regularizer uh, D. So uh, and since we have bounded, uh, uh, trajectory feedback, let's say, then we need to estimate our, ve our big vector of loss here. Uh, so we have two, ch two choice to do, like the estimates and the regularizer D. And like uh, I will now present our algorithm, so which is named implicit exploration oh, uh, online. Wait, uh, could, I ask a, could I ask a question regarding the previous yes. slides and regarding the feedback that you get? So I understand that you get to observe the rewards for along the trajectory for all state action parity to visit, but do you really get to observe the probability that multiplies L? Which seems to be like baked into the loss function, so you don't know the probability, right? Or, no, no, yeah, we we don't know. Like the setting is that we don't know the transition probability. So mm -hmm. in particular, mm -hmm. we cannot compute this these things, which is the product of probability. We only observe so the state, the action, and the reward mm -hmm. uh, along mm -hmm. this trajectory. Right. And so then basically, more. you have some kind of like rather unusual feedback about the loss function, right? Because you, you only observe like one factor, the reward, but there's this other probability that you don't actually observe. I mean, I guess you still have an unbi unbiased estimator of it. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah, we, but we will see just later. Oh, yes. All right. Okay. We we don't know. Uh, yes, we don't observe these things, and we cannot compute this realization plan. This it's not a probability. It's like uh, you need to multiply it by right. the realization plan to get a probability. But uh, yes, we don't observe it, but we oh, yeah. will be able to estimate it. In fact. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so really, just what I what I wanted to understand is that this is not one of the traditional feedback models considered in online linear optimization this is no, something no. else no no as i said like we have more information like it's uh, yes. it's uh it's different yes like we have uh, we have all this uh, but we do not have a scalar in fact we just like we observe the state and the action and in fact this will help us to uh, estimate this uh, uh realization plan of nature like this uh, term in green. all right great um, so makes it clear thank you <coughs> And uh, so, exactly. So it's, that's what we will do exactly. So um, our uh, algorithm is like with two choices. So, so one first, let's say, um, natural choice for the estimation is to pick, uh, 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 as you say, um, uh, an unbiased estimate of the um, of the loss. So it's this, this term here. So uh, all we can check it's uh, unbiased. Just with, if we pick the expectation, then uh, here we will have the rich probability, which is the product of these two terms. And since we divide by the realization plan of nature, we just keep uh, like the green part if you want. And here we have the reward. And it's exactly uh, what we have here. OK? Uh, so it's unbiased. Uh, the issue is that, like with this uh, estimate, uh, we only uh, we can only prove expectation bound, and we rather want a high probability one. So we will add uh, this uh, implicit exploration. That is, we will just add bias to our to our estimate to uh, control the variance of it. And uh, I will not say too much about it. Uh, and now uh, we also have to choose the regularizer. And for that, we will pick the dilated entropy. So what is the dilated entropy? It's this, um, this um, sum. So it's look from far like a kind of kullback labeler divergence. Uh, so the intuition behind is that uh, first, uh, since this realization plan is not a probability, uh, we cannot really see that as a Kullback labor divergence between two realization plans because they are not really probability. But the intuition is more the following that um, we will consider this uh, a random vector f, uh, which is kind of a, a sample of a realization plan. That is, it's al also a product of 0 and 1 here. And uh, this, uh, this fh of a knowing s is just the indicator function that the uh, a is equal to a certain so we sample from the um, the um, uh, policy so we in advance we sample an action for every state and then we just uh, um, uh, put one to this term here if the action is the one sample and uh, we multiply all this indicator function and we get this uh, big vector a random vector and the, uh, the first thing, interesting thing is that if you take the expectation of this big vector, then you, you get the realization plan. So in expectation, this term, it's exactly uh, this realization plan. And this dilated entropy is, in fact, the kullback labeler divergence between the distribution of this, uh, of this big random vector um, under the policy mu and under the policy mu prime. So we, we still have uh, a kind of uh, uh, interpretation, interpretation uh, which make it like a, a generalization of the um, usual, let's say, uh, exponential weight algorithm, except that we, are, uh, we work on something much more complicated than uh, the simplex for the exponential weight, where we rather consider like the space of realization plan, which is uh, usually named triplex. So, so like, we have a, a bigger structure, but in the spirits, it's kind of the same regularizer that the exponential weight. Um, so these two choices uh, uh, are like um, give our, um, our, um, our algorithm for this setting. 
Uh, and like, what is also important with this regularizer is that like it, uh, we can have a very efficient implementation of the algorithm. So uh, like if I sketch a bit like the implementation, um, so like first, let's say you, you generated a trajectory in your 3MDP. Uh, um, so you have state and action <coughs> and you receive reward. And then you will just uh, go back uh, only in this trajectory. So you will um, um, start from the final state of the trajectory and uh, go back to the initial one. And doing so, you can like construct the estimate of the loss uh, with the formula I just gave uh, before, uh, which is easy. And then you can you need also to compute recursively a kind of uh, um, log moment generating function. And given this function, it's very uh, like easy to update the policy because you only need to update the policy along the trajectory and um, and um, only there. Like if you have another state which is not like um, which do not belongs to the trajectory, then you will not update the policy. It will be the same as before. So you can only do the update along this trajectory, starting at the end of the uh, at the trajectory, computing recursively this quantity uh, z, z here, and you get in updating the policy. In particular, so uh, if you, uh, you look at it, then the time complexity, it's like the complexity, uh, so it's the length of a trajectory times the number of actions, so it's HA. So it's kind of very cheap like uh, to do this kind of update. And the space complexity is just uh, like what you need to store the policy. So this is kind of interesting. <coughs> And uh, we can also prove a regret bound for this algorithm. So if you tune properly uh, the learning rates you have for the online mirror descent and um, the parameter of the um, implicit exploration, then uh, for, uh, you can prove a regret bound with high probability. OK, well, I should not put the delta here because we don't see it. But uh, it's with high probability uh, up to log term, something of order s square root of h80. Uh, so, which is like so what we could expect, in fact, in this kind of uh, MDP. Uh, as lower bound, so we don't have a lower bound, but we conjecture uh, like from uh, like what we can do in stochastic MDP. So, uh, keeping in mind that uh, we have this additional tree structure that could change a bit the thing, but uh, we will uh, expect something of square root of a h s t. So. We have a, a gap of square root of s between the this uh, um, this lower bound or the conjectured lower bound and what we uh, get as a regret bound. So this it's a, it's an open question. What is the optimal weight? Like uh, um, what is suboptimal? Is there the regret bound or the lower bound? <coughs> okay. Uh, and now I will move like to um, to the what we are in first interested in. It's uh, in perfect information game. So uh, as uh, like um, like practical example, what you can think of it's uh, poker. Or in particular here, I am I am showing like the simplified poker, so the Kun, Kun poker one game. Um, so uh, just to say, so we are limited to two players, and uh, so and zero sum because uh, we assume that like uh, we, like the loss of one player is the gain of the other. So as in uh, poker, for example, and um, in, in perfect information game, we, we see it with this example where in fact you cannot see the card of your opponent, so you have only uh, imperfect information uh, for the game. So uh, we will model it uh, as follow. So um, uh, um, our two player zero sum game uh, with imperfect information. So uh, we keep the um, three MDP that we have before, except no, uh, we have two players. So, uh, so like first we have this uh, uh, state space, um, which is uh, like assumed to be finite on horizon. And now we have two players. So the max player and the min player. And each one will have an uh, action let's mm, denote by A, like that be belongs to some state uh, A, and same thing for the min player, so they will uh, fight each other. <coughs> and now we will assume that the rewards uh, are for the max player, 
and it's exactly equal because equals because we are in zero sum game uh, to the loss of the min player. And it will depend no so on the state and the action of the max player and the action of the min player. Uh, same thing, we will have a transition probability, uh, which will depend also on the state action of the max player and min player. Uh, so we have this structure. And in particular, like the difference also with what we uh, see previously is that uh, now the max player only see information sets. That's all we will uh, um, <coughs> like model the imperfect information. Uh, so what is the uh, in information set space? It's just a partition here of the state. Uh, so we have one for the max player and one for the min player. And the, the player will only observe this in, uh, information set. So uh, it, may, it can may not know the state. So this is one example of, uh, uh, of a par a partitioning the the state space uh, for the max from the point of view of the max player. Uh, so in particular, if you are uh, if you look at information set uh, x three here, <coughs> then uh, you know if you are and we will add uh, an, another assumption. So first we uh, keep the tree structure of our MDP, and we also uh, consider that we have perfect recall. That is, um, uh, we assume that player does not forget uh, action nor observation. Uh, more like you can see, as in poker, for example, we will not forget like the cards that you have or the bet you made. And uh, in fact, this like you, we will model it by the fact that uh, if we are at a certain uh, information set, then there is an, a unique sub trajectory as before, leading to this information set. Like for example, here for X3, we will know that we uh, we took action A2 and we saw first like the uh, information set X1. And in, for example, this is like a, a wrong partition because um, if you still consider the information set X3, then here you you don't know if you uh, if you took action A1 or A2. So this is wrong. It's a wrong partition. And it's, uh, it, it, uh, it does not fit the perfect recall assumption. Uh, so we will. Uh, so we assume that for any information set, you have only one trajectory of information set action leading to it, as just as before. And uh, you can. You, we have exactly the same thing for the min player here uh, in yellow. Uh, and uh, yeah, just note that like the, the first information set action is equal to the second one, no, to the third one, and same thing, second one and first one are equal. <coughs> okay. And um, like what we want to learn in this uh, game, it's uh, uh, the policy that attains the Nash equilibrium. So first note that we can rewrite the value of a certain profile. So profile is just a, a policy for the max player in red here and a policy for the min player in uh, orange. And again, we can do exactly the same trick as before. We can split. Uh, so the value will be a sum of our information set and action here for the max and min player of something that we can split in three terms. So one due to the max player, no one due to the min player, and one term which is due to nature. So it's a bit different from before because we have to sum over all the states that belongs to the intersection of the information set of the max and the min player. But otherwise, it's exactly the same thing as before. And again, so these three terms, so uh, the, the green one, the one of nature, only depends on the reward and the transition probability. And the two other only depends on the respe of their respective policy. Uh, so we have something like very similar to um, um, uh, what we just have in the part one. And so the Nash equilibrium, so the value of a Nash equilibrium, it just uh, uh, like when you take the maximum of the max policy for the max player and minimum uh, for the min player of the value of, uh, of the value of a certain profile. And uh, so as usual, but we will not really use it. You can swap the min and the max. Uh, but uh, what is important here, it's like we will define um, the exploit theory gap, so this quantity will allow us to measure or close um, um, a profile is to uh, the Nash equilibrium. 
So uh, this exploitability gap of a profile, it's just this difference where we consider the value here uh, of the mean policy uh, against its best response. So the best response is the worst player that you can uh, give to the mean player in when he, it shows uh, the, um, this uh, as policy uh, new. And same thing for the max player, and you take the difference. And uh, what is easy to note is that no, if mu and new are um, uh, Nash equilibrium, then one is the best, it's, uh, it's the best response of the other. So in particular, this quantity is equal to zero. And in fact, uh, in general, it's positive. So what we will try is to minimize uh, the exploitability gap. So yes, that's what I said. Like when the exploitability gap is equal to zero, then uh, we are sure that we have a Nash equilibrium. And the goal is to minimize it. Um, and uh, so how do we learn? Uh, what is our learning framework? So it's the following. So we will consider that we are in a self-play setting. So we control both the max player and the min player. So we will interact with the game. And uh, after some interaction, what we will do is we will op output a profile uh, and uh, hoping that this profile will, will have an exploitability gap as small as possible. So uh, meaning that uh, it will be close to uh, an actual recovery. So uh, precisely, uh, so for each episode T, now we will pick a policy for the max player and for the mill player, <coughs> so uh, simultaneously. And, um, and then we generate a trajectory. So like the trajectory, it's kind of the same thing as before, except that now we only observe uh, the information set. So the one for the max player and the one for the min player of the current state uh, HT. So in, in particular, this state belongs to these two partitions. Then we sample an action according to uh, the policy of the max player, the same thing for the min player. And um, we, uh, we generate the, the reward that we will observe, in fact, and the next state. And uh, yes, what is important here is that like, what do we observe as a, a jump uh, uh, in self-play, it's like we only observe the trajectory, that is the information set of the max player and the min player, the action that we sample, and the reward, and nothing more. And in particular, we don't know uh, the reward function nor the um, um, uh, probability transition, and also uh, the state. We only observe uh, the um, um, information set. So this is what, uh, what is our uh, bounded feedback in this case. And um, like the K tool, now if we want to apply uh, the, the algorithm I present before, is that we will link uh, this exploitability gap to, uh, certain, uh, to a certain notion of regret. So if we consider a sequence of profile, a mu t, nu t here. So for example, one we generated uh, like during the learning procedure. <clears throat> then for the max player and the min player, we can define a regret. So now the regret is like as we are in our uh, adversarial setting, except that now the uh, uh, MDP is parametrized by um, the opponent player. So we do not have T, but new T here. Same thing for the min player, we define our, uh, the, the regret as follow. Uh, and what is uh, interesting with these two uh, regrets is that uh, if we consider the average policy of this sequence, so the average policy is not the, aver uh, the average of the policy, but it's rather the average of the realization plan, which are not equivalent thing. Uh, so like to compute them, you just take, for example, the sum of the realization plan for a certain uh, information set X and action A, and you just normalize this so that when you sum over A, then you get something which goes uh, equals to one. And the important notion here is that uh, this realization, the, the realization plan of the average policy, it's exactly the uniform average of the realization plan. And this is because like the realization plan leaves a sum in some convex set. Um, okay, and uh, like the main tool here is that we can upper bound the exploitability gap of this average policy 
uh, by the sum of the regret di divided by t. <coughs> so if we, are, we can control the regret, then uh, we have for free uh, a, a bar, uh, like an upper a bound on the, on the exploitability gap. And this is exactly what we will do. So the idea is to use like the um, uh, our algorithm to mini minimize both of the regrets. So we will have two instances of uh, the algorithm, one for the max player and one for the min player. And uh, at the end, what we will output, it's the average of the policy generated by the two regret minimizer. And um, why we can do that is that, if, for example, if you see things from the point of view of the uh, max player, uh, then uh, you can rewrite the value uh, as like this big sum. So we have uh, like as before, like the realization plan of the max player, and we can put everything else in uh, one term, uh, which will be the equivalent of the nature for the max player, uh, where we regroup like the term because of nature, but also the one because of the um, main player. Okay, so it's a, there is a T here. Uh, because it's new T, and in particular, these things will change uh, from uh, one game to the other, and that's why before we uh, we have to consider adversarial uh, MDP because we will not have the same at each episode at each game. Uh, and like for free, no, uh, since we have an upper bound on uh, the regret for uh, our algorithm, then we uh, can um, we. We have for free an upper bound on the exploitability gap. Precisely, uh, we have something that converge in one and square root of one over t. And uh, so we have, so we have the same dependence. So now it's uh, over the um, information set, uh, the number of information set for the max and the min player. And uh, we, as you see, we just sum the two regrets. So, uh, so the first point is that this algorithm, like uh, for solving the, um, the game, it's a model-free one because at not, um, we don't try to uh, estimate the, neither the reward or the probability transition. And we only the only feedback that we need, it's the trajectory feedback. So we, we don't assume any no prior knowledge on the game. Even uh, we don't assume to know like the structure of the um, of the information set, we don't need to know it uh, uh, in advance. We just we will just like uh, explore it somehow uh, during the um, the uh, like uh, during the learning phase. And uh, so and as you uh, saw before, like for the uh, for the I XOMD algorithm, we have a, a very it's a, um, a very small time complexity. So do we have the same here? Uh, the only point is that we still need to compute the average policy. Um, but um, um, fortunately, uh, we can do it uh, like very efficiently. Um, like the idea is to, uh, so I sketch it, but uh, I will not give the detail. But the, the idea is that the policy does not change between two updates. Uh, um, of uh, like the uh, like during the training, and so we can update uh, or maintain um, the the average policy uh, in an in a online fashion. So morally, like when we um, execute an action and see an information set, like when we generate the trajectory, we just have to back up some quantity. So it's this mu ring, which is in fact rather like the sum of the um, uh, realization plans uh, instead of its average, but uh, it's okay because uh, once we have it, uh, we can just compute the average like that. So uh, we we will maintain all these uh, these terms like uh, during the like during the learning, and we just need at the end to uh, update every like every information set uh, once to um, uh, because. Maybe some uh, were not updated since a long time, um, so it's this uh, last for a loop, and we still have to pay. So we will have to uh, visit all the information set and action. So that's why we have a, um, 
uh, an additional term in the complexity here, uh, which is um, which depends on the number of information set and uh, uh, for the max and the min player. But otherwise, like this is like the overall time complexity, not the one per, per, per episode. We'll, uh, we will have a complexity of per episode of order h a plus b. So the length of the trajectory times the number of action. So it's still very um, uh, cheap. And for the space complexity, then we just need uh, like uh, as much space to to um, to store the the policy of the max and the min player. And uh, uh, for a comparison, so like uh, if you consider two well-known algorithms for this setting, so uh, namely the CFR algorithm and the Monte Carlo CFR algorithm. Uh, so morally, you can prove the same rate for, uh, like of convergence of the exploitability gap for uh, the three algorithms, including ours, except that we have a, a much smaller time complexity. That is like if you consider like the CFR algorithm, then uh, if you like you have somehow to to um, to traverse all the tree, uh, the um, uh, the tree of state. And uh, for that, you, you pay at each uh, um, game or episode uh, something of order S, uh, which could be like much larger than uh, the number of information set and much larger than uh, H, like the length of uh, trajectory. And uh, additionally, like this algorithm assumes that the game is known, that, that you know the reward, uh, the structure of the state and the information set and the transition probability. So it's not with a uh, trajectory bounded feedback. Uh, you can uh, simplify uh, or low, lower the time complexity uh, by using a Monte Carlo CFR algorithm. Uh, so morally, you will just sample uh, uh, for this algorithm a transition and uh, action of the opponent, but you still have to pay uh, the number of information set uh, to update the policy at each uh, episode, which could still be uh, large, uh, for example, like in, uh, in poker, and you still have some all to to have prior knowledge on the game uh, for um, for Monte Carlo CFR algorithm. And uh, I guess now I will conclude. So, uh, like to sum up, uh, so we present an algorithm for uh, adversarial learning in uh, MDP with a tree assumption. Uh, so this is the first line. And uh, we we obtain like uh, a regret bound uh, of this order, so right, it's an open problem. If uh, well, I will see it later, uh, and, um, like a regret a regret bound. Uh, so this algorithm enjoy uh, like a, a very small time complexity, and uh, well, the space complexity is like not very really surprising. And what is um, interesting is that we can just instantiate like two um, two algorithms for one for the max player and one for the min player, if we want to learn in the, in a game, and uh, like for free, um, given the regret bound, we have a, a convergence rate uh, uh, towards um, uh, Nash equilibrium, uh, and uh, also like uh, like the the time complexity is uh, uh, like also small and like as we see here uh, like this additional term is just what we discussed before it's like to compute the average and um, and so this work for this work we have the following open question or future work uh, first like uh, what could be interesting is to get the optimal rate for uh, the adversarial tree MDP um, so like do we have this uh, extra s square, um, square root of s factor in the regret bound, uh, and like we can ask uh, exactly the same question for uh, like the imperfect imperfect information game uh, that I just presented. Uh, so with bounded feedback, and knowing that, uh, for example, if the game is known and you have uh, first order feedback, so as for example uh, CFR algorithm, that if you know everything and you are you are ready to pay. Uh, um, a lot uh, uh, in terms of time complexity for each iteration, then there is algorithm that probably have a, a, a rate of order one over t, so um, which is like larger than what we get in one over square root of t. 
except that you don't have bandit feedback. So like, uh, what, what, like yeah. it's not clear if you, you and probably not uh, that if you can have the same rate um, uh, with uh, with uh, a bandit feedback or trajectory feedback. And um, uh, last uh, open problem is like, uh, can we add some structure on the game? Because um, um, like, uh, we st like usually this uh, X and Y, like the number of uh, information set are still very large. And uh, um, like uh, it, it could, like we don't really want to pay it uh, at all in the regret bond or like in the, in the rate. So for that, uh, we could, for example, add some structure on the game and see uh, how we can uh, exploit it. And uh, I will stop here and I add in the slide like uh, several references that are also in the paper. Thank you. All right, very nice. Thank you. All right, so. Uh, I suppose there is plenty of questions. I have plenty of questions, but it seems that uh, we already have one volunteer, Gabriele, who is Hi, uh, full of questions. <laughs> so please go ahead. Yeah, uh, yeah. Th thanks a lot for the for the talk. That was that was very interesting. I feel like in a way, it kind of like closes a, a question that we had left open. Like we were working in the same kind of setting, uh, which we actually used to call interactive bandit, but I guess it's the same as this like trajectory bandit feedback for games. Um, and what we could get was t to the three over four regret instead of t to the one half like you do. Um, and we were trying to do basically what, what you were doing that is like get like one, like t to the like square, square root t regret. But one thing that we couldn't do was um, to get the regularization right. And you, you seem to be using the uh, dilated regularizer from like Christian Kroor, uh work from 2015, I think. Um, but one, one, one issue with that that we had was that um, that regularizer has a very bad um, uh, strong complexity parameter. And if you actually look in the paper, the regularizer is not quite like that. They have like some, some multipliers in front of each term to get one strong complexity. Because it turns out that without those multipliers, you would only get like you know like uh, exponentially bad strong convexity, right? Which which clearly would come up in the in the regret bound. Um, and if you want to get one strong convexity, on the other hand, you need exponentially large constants. And also those constants, like the the multipliers that you need, depend on the structure of the of the tree, and are built like in a in a bottom up fashion. Which means that really we were not able to get anything that was model free because basically to get those multipliers right, we had to Kind of like know the structure of the, of the of the tree of information sets bottom up, um, right? So I was kind of like curious to know how you sidestep like that issue with the regularizer. Um, okay, so I do not uh, put the details of uh, this part uh, like in the slide. Uh, just like for the proof, <coughs> I just have like something very simple, but you will not see it. So morally, it's like when you want to control this term that you have this issue. Um, usually, and uh, we didn't try, in fact, to to prove uh, uh, this strong convexity of the regularizer. We just like at end uh, upper uh, like uh, upper bound these terms, and in particular, like the key point was to use that uh, <coughs> um, uh, with um, like bandit feedback. Uh, your thread, well, I do not have it uh, here. But uh, use, like the loss, the estimate of the loss is supported only on the trajectory. Uh, so this was like an important point. And then otherwise, uh, yes, we just like uh, power bounded this term at end, and we didn't try to prove any uh, strong convexity uh, uh, property uh, for the regularizer. Um, but, but you're still think. using. Like you're still uh, using. Oh. Online mirror descent, right? With the regularizer. Yeah. So, like we, as you, uh, uh, we kind of uh, uh, use the same tricks, like the same um, uh, way to prove as for uh, X3 algorithm. So we we rewrite. So, like the key point is that you yes, these terms, uh, you can rewrite it as a, in fact, something uh, um, which appear here. 
uh, this uh, log partition kind of uh, log partition function. And then the, the main goal is then to, I don't know if it's upper bound or lower bound, but I think it's upper bound these things. Uh, and for that, we, we just upper bound this thing at n uh, along the trajectory. So morally, like we, uh, and with the same trick, so uh, we transform the log in something linear and uh, we uh, consider the um, uh, polynomial approximation of the exponential. And then at the end, it appears to, uh, to work. So, but uh, we, we didn't try to, to prove something like uh, general in the strong, cover like strong coversity of this regularizer, uh, which, kind of, which is kind of difficult, I think. I, th uh, that's interesting. Okay, that's interesting. I, I might follow up with you later because I'm, I'm very curious because that the trick of you know linearizing that's also what what they do when they work on the regularizer like in the 2015 paper. But the thing is that you're basically ending up subtracting too much, so that's why you need the multipliers like as you go up in the tree to make sure that like the cancellation terms that you get from below the tree do not end up like impairing the. The strong convexity so so, so that basically like when you're at the, at the root of the tree you still have that you have something that resembles like some, some entropy that is strongly convex instead of having like negative terms uh, but I, 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 I might follow up with, with yeah. you offline cause, yeah, cause yeah that was really like the, the one thing that we couldn't can't but like quite get right we always had those constants and they were like defined bottom up so we couldn't really do this in a in a model free way I can I can have uh... Like we try at some point also to prove like uh, something like a, a strong convexity bound for this regularizer, and we end up with something very big at the end, like in the constant uh, in uh, in front of it, and uh, we we did not manage to uh, do, do something that with the proof uh, with that, and uh, I think yes, like deal it with it uh, like uh, at end uh, like. Yeah, I feel like what, what's known in the literature is that big constant. So like the, the dilated regularizer is known to be kind of tricky. Actually, there is like some, some work that Christian and I did to kind of like fi fix the diameter of that regularizer. And we have an, another one that might actually improve your constants. You could probably like drop it in. It's like at EC this year. Uh, but like yeah. the regularizer for, for like trees is known to be kind of like tricky in terms of like uh, not depending exponentially on the, on the tree size. Um, but anyway, like I... I, 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 I Okay, I totally agree, but like, yes, uh, the point was really to upper bound what we need and nothing more. Uh, and uh, I think it was rather this thing, the trick uh, at the end. But we can discuss uh, if you want uh, after. Sure, yeah, yeah, thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah, so, so on this front, I, I would just add that, well, if you work with these uh, mirror descent algorithms, there's basically like, I mean, there are several ways that you can go about the analysis. One is through strong convexity, right? To say that, well, you know, mu t and mu t plus one are not too far from each other, right? So you do like a sensitivity analysis of these uh, of these objects. One way to do that is via strong convexity of the regularization. But you can also do like a direct algebraic proof. You know, you just write down the expressions of these and then just compare algebraically how much they are changing and directly work out. And this is what uh, this is what Pierre and the others seem to have done here pretty much. Actually, thanks. Yeah, so uh, so my question is, uh, is, uh, is where exactly does this uh, dependence on S come from? Can you explain that? Uh, yes, so uh, like, so if you look at the proof, you have two, um, uh, two uh, reasons. The first one is that, like, uh, for the so here, as usual, you pay the divergence with uh, like the initial um, term, and since we have like this dilated entropy, then you pay here s already. Um, <clears throat> it's morally if you look at the dilated entropy. Well, I, I didn't write the. I don't think, but morally, like, let's say you you keep s here and you 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 sum over a after. And then you just have the realization plan to go to S times kullback labeler divergence between policy. Okay. And so the kullback labeler divergence, you pay log A, log A, and then you have S times this thing. That's why you have an S uh, there. And then uh, you also have an S for the second term. Um, sorry, I lost the proof. 
you say you also have an s here because well it's rather usual here it's like uh you end up with the sum of of the loss and uh, uh this is of order uh, s because you do not multiply this by the realization plan at the end because you cancel it with the um, uh, because you divide it by it so you have another s here and uh, that's why morally you have s uh uh, at the end. So you have one S on one side and on the other side. Right. So that basically one of them contributes the square root of S and the other one also co contributes the square root of S and together yeah. you get S. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. And because because my my question was that, well, maybe you could improve these guarantees if you did not use this dilated entropy or conditional entropy, but rather like the marginal entropy, right? So that instead of like the log policy ratio maybe there you could like take oh no um yeah i, I guess these these objects are the same here i i don't know um uh i i don't know which one other you want but if you have plenty of choice uh for the regularizer um at some point we tried yes as you said something like uh mu s a and not conditional so that's what you said uh so i think it worked but there is one drawback is that like the implementation is not easy at all or at least like uh not as easy as this one uh yeah and so i was just wondering if that could get like the square root of s uh um, i think we still have uh, 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 s s at the end with this uh, regularizer yeah, yeah. But, but, but maybe maybe this doesn't make that much sense anyway because uh because basically your realization plan is really just a product product of conditional probabilities right so it's not like a state action distribution it's not a joint distribution no, no that's the main point yeah so if if you would put like the the joint distribution in the log right i mean you, you it, you're not even able to work with that, right? Because it's only the conditional that you can put in there. You cannot put the joint distribution because that involves a bunch of unknown parameters. Uh, yeah, so I'm not sure I follow you here. Uh, um... Yeah, I just basically convinced myself that this is pretty much the only viable choice that uh, this, this one that you ended up with. Yeah, yeah, there's 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 really no obvious way to improve things, even even um, in a computationally inefficient way. Um, yeah, but we yes, I don't know. Um, um. Right, very nice. So, anybody else questions? I wonder about whether this rate is optimal. The one over root t. I mean, like there is more regularity to this problem, right? So maybe smoothing optimism, whatnot. Wasn't there a line of work in two-player zero-sum games where they were trying to use optimism to get faster rates? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, that's that's why I say that in the conclusion, like uh, you can have one over t, uh, like if you use the like. Yeah. Uh, mirror prox or uh, optimistic uh -huh. mirror descent um, for sure. Uh, with bandit feedback, it's not clear at all. Uh, if you can get the same rate, probably not, because uh, you have to pay one square root of t uh, somewhere. Um, and, uh, um, and that's it, yeah. Uh, it's, not, mm -hmm. it's not clear at all. Uh, mm. Right. So maybe it's actually, so if we disregard this, uh, like the distinction shouldn't be in terms of like that we have this bandit or semi-bandit feedback or whatnot. If I want to solve a game, uh, whatever, and I do have a simulator or whatnot, right? Like whatever I can do is is, is okay, right? If you're thinking in terms of like, what is the complexity of solving a game using 
a uh, simulator um, then uh, <laughs> maybe you can do other things you don't you're not really boxed in into this this framework and uh, but but it seems that it's not trivia because uh, you may be paying a high price for example if you're not ready to pay a price that's guess with the number of states although is it is it clear so here the time and space complexity didn't depend on the number of states at all it only depended on the number of uh, like the the size of the information set kind of thing right mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. like what do you mean it's not clear like you you you, you want rather to say that you should have a, some s somewhere i don't yeah like what's the intuitive reason that there is no s anywhere uh like intuitively here it's like from the max player and the min player you only consider things through um uh their information set and like right. more things Technically, it's when you write things like that. Right, right. So the decomposition, it, it just has an average over the states. Yes, exactly. Like yeah, you just don't a number. Who cares how many states they are there? Yeah. Maybe the variance of that thing is what matters or something like that. Uh, yes, well, again, it's not an aver It's not like an expectation because this thing is not a probability. It's not clear. <laughs> Yeah, 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 but I'm just using these terms as like a first approximation. Uh, interesting. Hmm. So, could could you maybe explain like uh, what is the importance of this uh, tree structure assumption and and how would you go about removing this assumption? In general, so like uh, in these derivations, there seem to be yeah something crucial. I think like uh, like if you do not have the tree assumption, like uh, this thing, it's kind of dead, and uh, you break you break almost everything. I think, um, <clears throat> uh, like I will not be able to uh, to do the same analysis. Like we really need the tree structure, like to first like make it as uh, um, online linear regret minimization. So like the jet, we have this. Uh, um product um and uh, like if you want to drop that uh no, honestly i don't know it's not clear at all so um, you, um uh, yes right so so basically if if there were loops right so there were multiple parts <laughs> Then you would also need to sum here over all the possible parts, right? And <laughs> yeah, it, up. it will. Mm. It's not clear because, like, you will have first you will, for different paths you have a different realization plan, so you have this sum, and uh, uh, I don't know. I didn't try at all. Uh, it's not clear uh, that you can factorize things uh, like that. Um, Oh yeah, yeah. You can. You definitely cannot factorize things. Then you mm -hmm. just end up with like uh, something that looks a lot messier. Yeah. No, uh, honestly, yeah. I, like it, it looks difficult. I cannot say too much more. I didn't try, uh, but uh, yeah. Uh, like, well, yes. What I can say is that if you remove that, you break everything uh, here. Yeah. This is this is a very neat observation. To say. Well, I suppose. I mean, has this has this been made before? This particular observation. I mean, uh, from from what Gabriella was saying, I I understand that this is probably not as new because they have been working on this problem and they've been using very similar tools, so they must have stumbled upon this idea in some form or the other. Uh, yeah, yeah, but like, you mean the setting or? Uh... No, no, no. So I mean, I mean, this particular reduction to linear. Uh, uh, no, yes, it's well known. It's it's not uh, like uh, 
And I, we, I know that like uh, Gabriel Farina has a paper on it. And I think we cite it, uh, like uh, uh, I don't remember which one, uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's not new at all. And uh, in fact, uh, like, uh, uh, but maybe I'm sure uh, it, it will be like uh, better than me to answer. But like, you have like this, per uh, everything starts with this perfect recall assumption and this work of von Stiegel. Uh, but uh, um, I think it's uh, cited like. This way to rewrite thing with realization plan, uh, I, I, uh, from what I know, uh, it's due to this von Stiegel paper. And there is even like maybe I think I saw in also in one of your paper, uh, Gabriele, uh, that there is also a Russian guy who did the same thing, and there is a paper in Russian uh, where. And it's fun because you can look at the figure and recognize like this perfect recall assumption and the tree structure, but it's right on in Russian. So I think it's older, even older. So. Yeah, yeah. There's like some obscure Russian paper that a lot of people like for, forget to cite for, for that. But yeah, I mean like this kind of like analysis for extensive form games is, is kind of standard. I mean like effectively, you know, like extensive form games like look very different from normal form games and have like all the observations and you know like uh private you know like uh moves and stuff but at the end of the day when when you care about two players or some they just have the same structure as like typical matrix matrix games you have like max main of like a bilinear objective which is your expected utility and then the only difference is that the domains for the minimization maximizations are not really probability simplices but they are like this sequence form polytopes that come from the von Stengel or the Russian guy, but effectively, like you know, like analytically, it, it, it's kind of like the same thing. And and this stuff is used in poker. I mean, like you know, I, I come more maybe from the game theory optimization side side than the reinforcement learning. Uh, but all, all of this stuff, I mean, th this stuff is like been used in like all, all the like poker applications, like this this kind of analysis with with linear losses and program minimization and and, and all of that. By the way, Zuaran asked uh, the question. Uh, maybe he can ask his question related to poker. If he's not, doesn't have a microphone, I can ask for him. He's just wondering whether this tree structure really appears in a poker applications. Uh, well, well, you, I think you can answer. Uh, uh yeah i think yes of course like we have uh like our modelization it's kind of like not very the usual one uh the usual one it's better one like the figure i first show when you, you assume that the game is like rather sequential and the two player does not move at the same time uh but it's kind of equivalent at the end yeah, yeah, this definitely has been used in in poker, especially for the the end games. Even like in the in the live play against like the the top professionals, like when they did like the the big competitions. Um, at, at least like, I guess I'm more familiar with like Norm's work. Uh, but there, like when they were doing the the end games, given like you know like the, the end of the game, they were actually you know like doing this kind of stuff on on a real tree, uh, like to solve like for like the, the very end of the game, and then. Like at, at the kind of like at, at the beginning of the game, they were doing a, like a bigger abstraction, and they were using like some Monte Carlo sampling. But again, like the, the underlying model was a, a tree, so the I stuff definitely. The question yeah. was whether there are loops or not. There, there are there are no loops. There are some abstraction techniques where like you kind of like decide, for example, that to reduce the search space, like you will treat different states as like the same. Um, so. Some some people do that, uh, but but as far as I know, like for for that poker bot, for example, everything was on a tree. There were there, there were like no cycles. Can always unloop, anyways, right? I'm I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, like a lot of the techniques I'm familiar with, adding the loops is not really something that we know how to do. I guess like as long as it's, it's like a like a cyclic graph maybe but when you start having cycles i think a lot of the techniques that have been used in computational game theory uh at least like for the poker side of things like break with with cycles 
Sure, but um, like here, I mean, like there is a clear flow of time from the top to the bottom, right? And so the loop can only happen if you're coming down and then two things join. And if two things join, then that's an opportunity to save and compute, save on information. But you could also say that, well, I'm not going to join them. I just keep this as a tree. That has like then then you pay maybe in your regret in your compute and whatnot, but it's uh, in a way it's always an option, right? Yeah, yeah. But both things have been done. Usually when when people join things like they use like this kind of like idea of an abstraction where you reduce the the number of actions that, like and for poker in particular that kind of abstraction usually is kind of like hand tuned. Uh, even though there are like some people that looked into into ways to automate that, but I, as far as I know, w when people like you know join the states, that usually happens before you actually run the algorithm that solves the game. So it, it's usually not handled like at, at the same time. And and then maybe a real question is if if there were these joints there, uh, then a lot of these decompositions wouldn't goes through but some other decompositions like this value difference performance difference and what type of things still goes through so how much can we save uh in that case um and what are we giving up if we um somehow dismantle the loops Yeah, I actually don't have an answer. I, th I think that's that, that's very interesting. I I don't know if anybody has really looked looked into that. Um, one quick thing though about like th this work, like for the for the bandit, like you know, bandit optimization kind of like feedback where you only get the one number. There are some results that are known about when you when you have like a tree, and you can actually come up with an unbiased estimator, um, like in, in linear time in the in the size of the tree. So like you you can exploit this the structure to get like in a in a bias estimator. So I know that was like one of the last three questions that you had in the conclusion slides. And there is some some results about, about that. So because of the of the tree structure, you, you can kind of like simplify things. Of course, if you know the tra trajectory, you can do the kind of like important sampling thing that you were doing in this paper. Uh, but even if you don't know the trajectory, it's, it's not too hard to find an unbiased estimator.